Okay, it's, it's 2 p.m. on Friday, 25th September, so we're going to get started now. Uh, on behalf of the Singh Health Duke and U.S. Global Health Institute, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this webinar. Uh, today's presentation is part of our Global Health Seminar Series, which is held every Friday, the last every last Friday of the month at 2 p.m., so here we are again today, so please look out for these. We are always very happy to share all these different topics that we try to present across a dom uh, range of domains so that global health issues are brought to the attention of our viewers. Um, today we have a very uh, kind of interesting uh, style of presentation because normally sometimes we only have one person. Today we have a panel of four speakers. All these speakers are involved in the approach study and this study explores patients' perspectives across Asia on the topic of health awareness and palliative care. I'm going to go ahead and introduce all four speakers now so that we have a smooth flow of presentations once they start. So our first speaker is Professor Eric Finkelstein. He's the direct, executive director of the Lien Center for Palliative Care at Duke and US Medical School, as well as a professor with a program in health services and systems research. He's also a faculty of our Global Health Institute. Uh, Eric's research focuses on economic consequences of health behaviors with a primary emphasis on the use of traditional and behavioral economic incentives to influence behaviors in ways to improve public's health. He's really published very, very widely on this and has been included in the list of the world's most highly cited researchers across many years. Um, and we uh, have learned a lot of kind of very practical things from his studies. So um, this will be another example of those that uh, have an application in real life. Our second speaker is Assistant Professor Sem Semra Ozdemir, and I'm sure I've totally mispronounced her last name. Close. It's close. <laughs> She's also with the Lien Center for Palliative Care and the Program in Health Services and Systems Research and is affiliated with our Global Health Institute. Sembra's main research areas are preference assessment for healthcare services and products, medical decision making and decision aid research. She is especially interested in understanding the decision-making process between patients, family caregivers, and physicians, and this applies and applies this to decisions related to advanced serious illnesses, which is again something I think she'll talk about today. Her research focuses on developing interventions and decision aids to help individuals make decisions that align with their preferences and treatment goals. Um, so this is again something that I think she will really kind of bring to light how this is done. Um, our third speaker is Assistant Professor Chetna Malhotra, who's also with the Lien Center and the Program in Health Services and Systems Research. Her current work focuses on conducting health services research in the areas of palliative and end of care life, uh, end of life care for patients with advanced serious illnesses, including those with advanced cancer, heart failure, renal failure, and dementia. And she looks to improve delivery of palliative care services to these populations. Um, the fourth speaker is Assistant Professor Irene Chiu, who has the same affiliation, the Centralian Center for Palliative Care and the Program in Health Services and Systems Research. Um, Irene's background is in clinical health psychology. Her research and clinical interests include coping and adjustment to oncology-related psychological distress and symptoms. She is interested in the development of psychosocial interventions aimed at alleviating distress for patients and their families. And together, they'll really kind of bring all these different aspects of palliative care to you all today. So I hope we have a very interesting and kind of lively discussion about it. You will have the chance to uh, ask some questions at the end of the four presentations, and these are all quite short. So, you know, um, you can type your questions in, in the chat box at any time, uh, and they'll be addressed at the end. Um, so I look forward to kind of uh, have in continuing this discussion both with the panelists and with the whole audience. Please do keep yourselves on mute during the presentation and um, as noted this webinar will be recorded. So with that I'll hand over to you Eric to be the first presenter. Great, thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me okay. So I just put uh, my screen share on so everybody see it. I hope nod Amina see the screen. Okay great. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to present. So we're going to do sort of two things with this presentation. One is we're going to talk about some of the results from our approach project, uh, which is something I'm, I'm actually really excited to share as are the members of our team. But I also wanted to provide some context of this. So our center, the Leanne Center for Palliative Care, I, I would say is a, is a relatively new center in the grand scheme of palliative care research. We started in, in 2009. I took over in 
2014. And if you look at our, our vision and our mission, it's really around delivering high quality research and education to improve the, the lives of, of patients and, and caregivers uh, in Singapore and the region. Uh, and we want to be really a top-notch academic, academic medical center doing, or an academic palliative care center delivering on, on that goal. The problem was we weren't really doing anything outside Singapore, and so it's kind of hard to consider ourselves world-class when we're not even really benefiting anybody outside Singapore. So we realized that we need to, we needed to do something, or we wanted to do something that would help extend our reach a little bit. And so uh, the, the something that we wanted to do turned out to be the approach project, but the, the reality is, and I, I'm hopeful that some of our partners are, are with us uh, on, the, on the webinar, is that palliative care research, frankly, in Singapore and certainly in Southeast Asia beyond Singapore is really nascent. There's an incredible demand for palliative care from clinicians and, and, and allied health professionals there are some amazing clinicians who are, are servicing uh, the need, and there's just little time to develop uh, research in palliative care, and so the clinicians haven't really had opportunities to, to develop extensive research networks and research programs. And so, uh, you know, understanding really a lack of research capacity and incredibly high demand on clinicians, the question was, how could we do something useful? and add value, do some capacity building, and find some collaborators. And so approach really was our, our foray into this. And, and at its core, uh, approach really is a survey, right? Uh, but it adds value. And so what we decided to do was we said, hey, let's try to find some collaborators. We'll put together a survey. Uh, we'll find collaborators in the region, and we focused on cancer because that's where a lot of the palliative care tends to happen outside Singapore and to some extent in Singapore. And we said, let's just find some partners who are willing to do a survey uh, to 200 advanced cancer patients, adults, and we're just going to try to learn some stuff. And the goal here is to learn some stuff, but there's a secondary goal, and I think it may be more or, or certainly no less important, to find so some partners that are excited to work with us that we can learn from, they can learn from us, and ultimately we can publish some papers perhaps, but really we can uh, create a network and then use that network to uh, enhance research and, and education and palliative care in the region. And so the, the survey instrument uh, that we came up with, I'll talk about in a second, but really we got a teeny bit of funding from uh, the, the Asia Pacific Hospice and Palliative Care Network, what the network really has done for us is help us find uh, collaborators. But they gave a bit of money and we, um, I don't wanna get too much into the details, but when we funded our, our partner sites, which are really mostly cancer hospitals in, in the region, large cancer hospitals, we funded them at you know, most of what we thought it would take to do the field work in the region because we felt that they should have some skin in the game. So we, we didn't fully fund the partners because we wanted them to be on the hook. We also made sure and not fund until after IRB was approved so that they had to invest a little bit. Uh, but the reality is the big cost for, for doing this work is the effort uh, from our senior staff as well as our research assistants uh, putting the, the analyses together. So the money that we sent out the door, I think is trivial compared to the real cost of, of putting a study like this forward, which was probably several hundred thousand dollars. So we did have some cost shifting. Now, if you are cost sharing, I should say, if you look at the, the domains, the key domains that we focused on in truth were really what our team uh, was interested in. So we're very interested in understanding quality of life and quality of care. Uh, we're interested in prognostic awareness, understanding preferences is an area that Semra and I have, have uh, spent a lot of energy on, use of complementary and alternative medicine. Uh, Irene is a psychologist. We had a, a domain on psychology. We also looked at self-blame and, and social stigma, which I'll talk a little bit about, and then uh, palliative care awareness and utilization. So we think these are all important, but the truth is we, it was somewhat of, you know, our own interest really led what we would put on the survey. But we you know, what we told our partners was there's a core domain that we would like to see included in all of the surveys, but feel free to add whatever you want for your own interest. So we didn't preclude additions, but we wanted each site to have these core components. And then other sites, some sites added additional components. 
Now, uh, recruitment, I, I mentioned earlier, we, we use the Asia Pacific Hospice Network, which is a really a network of who's who in palliative care in the region as a way to help find partners. We met on the sidelines of the uh, regional conference and really we, we uh, relied largely on, on Dr. Cynthia Go and, and word of mouth to connect us with, with potential partners. Uh, and you know what our role was really we developed the initial instrument we provided some seed funding we assisted with translation uh, we did the training and then we we really did the heavy lifting on the analysis but we encouraged the the site pis to lead the the manuscript writing as a way to build capacity uh, and we helped and we provided about as much help as they wanted but we really wanted this to be led by the sites uh, I won't get into the details, but, but every country really has a, a site, at least one site manuscript that we hope that they will lead. And then when we pull data, we have multi-site papers that we tend to lead. Uh, but we're open to sharing our data with anybody who might have uh, interest. Uh, the site PIs and their role was really to operationalize the study uh, and, and make sure that it, it, the data is collected at a, at a high quality. And so we teamed at least one of our senior folks with uh, the senior folks on the site, and they really created the, the, the team, and they are the ones who were responsible. So as of right now, we have uh, 13 sites uh, representing 10 countries in the region. Uh, we actually got some funding from the Duke Global Health Institute to do uh, more university in Kenya, which is a partner project for, for lots of stuff going on at the Global Health Institute and, and uh, where I've been working as well. Uh, so you can see, you know, here's a map, you can see some red dots, that's where, where we're at. We're open to adding more sites if we find partners that are excited to work with us. Uh, in terms of outputs, you know, as I said, part of the goal here is to publish papers and learn something. We, we're certainly doing that. We've published five papers, we have 400 review. Uh, six in, in progress and, and uh, a bunch more in the work. So I think from a research perspective, uh, I think the outputs have, have certainly been at least commensurate for the inputs, but I think uh, uh, it's been good. And then I think the, the, the real bonus is that we've met some great partners and we're looking to do more in the region. So uh, I will stop talking and really uh, start hitting the slide deck. You heard the introduction, so I'm gonna turn it over to, to Semra. Uh, and she's going to speak uh, on the first study, which is really about prognostic awareness and association with, with the health outcome. So, Samra, just let me know when to advance the slides and sure. just keep going. Sure. Thank you, Eric. Um, as you see, we have a very long list of co-authors for this study, and this study is under review right now. Um, this is because we use not only uh, the countries from uh, some of the countries from the approach study, but we also include Singapore data, which we collect, uh, collected through our compass study. So there is the baseline data from our compass study as well. So you will see some findings from Singapore as well. Next slide. So the main uh, aim of this study to investigate whether prognostic awareness is associated with anxiety, depressive symptoms, and spiritual well-being among advanced cancer patients. Actually, there's quite a bit studies on this topic among cancer um, patients. However, the findings are very mixed. Some studies show that prognostic awareness is associated with good outcomes, some show, on the other hand, that it's, associ there is, uh, it's associated with bad outcomes. Um, and some studies found that actually there's not even any association. So the findings are very mixed. And most of the research is done among non-Asian cancer patients. That's why we thought, you know, we should look at um, the prog how prognostic awareness is associated with these outcomes because there might be some cultural factors in terms of how patients process prognostic awareness. And also the mixed findings might be because there might be other factors moderating the relationship between prognostic awareness and these outcomes. So we decided to look at moderator effect of acceptance of illness because acceptance of illness is seen as a coping mechanism for cancer patients. So the second goal of this paper is to investigate whether acceptance of illness moderate this relationship between prognostic awareness and the outcomes I just listed. 
Next slide, please. So um, let me tell you how we assess prognostic awareness. Um, we use one of the very common methods. We basically looked at whether patients think that the current medications they are taking uh, for their cancer will cure their cancer. Um, if they say no, which is the correct answer, we classify that as accurate prognostic awareness. If they said no or uh, yes, sorry, you know, it will cure, these medications are going to cure my cancer. Or if they said not sure, then we classify this as inaccurate prognostic awareness. And acceptance of illness was measured by one item which said I, ha I have accepted my illness, which patients could choose from not at all to very much. Um, anxiety symptoms was measured by uh, the anxiety subscale of heads scale. Depressive symptoms was also measured using heads. And spiritual well-being, which has um, two subscales of meaning and fate, was uh, measured by using facet SP, spiritual well-being um, scale. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so here are, you can see the countries we included in this uh, paper, China, India, Singapore, Sri Lanka, and Vietnam. And let's first look at what were the rates of uh, reporting accurate prognostic awareness. And as you see, um, as you see the rates here are actually very low. Prognostic awareness is very low among this patient population. So overall, only 16% of the patients reported accurate prognostic awareness. The highest rate was from Singapore, and it was only 29%. And the lowest uh, were uh, from Sri Lanka and India with 4% and 7%. So there's definitely um, like problems, like most patients don't seem to know uh, they uh, uh, have an accurate understanding of their prognosis. Um, next, let's look at the acceptance of illness. Look, uh, so the good news after giving you some bad news, acceptance of illness was um, um, quite common and most patients actually had higher levels of acceptance of illness. Next slide. So these are the coefficients for the associations between prognostic awareness and psychological outcomes for anxiety, depression, and to two subscales of spiritual well-being. And they were all significant. So patients who reported accurate prognostic awareness also reported higher anxiety, higher depressive symptoms, and poorer spiritual well-being. So it looks like from these findings, accurate prognostic awareness has, um, has some negative unintended uh, uh, consequences. Next slide. Then we looked at, um, okay, how about acceptance of illness? Does that make a difference? So we created an interaction effect between prognostic awareness and acceptance of illness so that we can look at the moderator effect of accepting. And uh, we found that it was the relationship was not significant for depression, but it was significant for anxiety and spiritual well, two domains of spiritual well-being. So based on these findings, what we found that compared to patients with accurate prognostic awareness, but lower acceptance of illness, patients with accurate, accurate prognostic awareness and higher acceptance of illness reported lower anxiety and higher spiritual well-being. So the good news here is that acceptance of illness moderated um, prognostic awareness related negative psychological outcomes. Next slide. So our suggestion based on these findings that when prognostic awareness, uh, pro prognostic information is given to the patients, it should be given alongside psychosocial interventions targeting and enhancing acceptance of illness. This is quite important because as you see, the, um, the levels of um, prognostic awareness is quite low in Asia and physicians in Asia may be withholding prognostic information because of fear of worsening patient's condition or it might be because of the request coming from the family. However, you know, individuals are different and there are cultural factors, the countries are different. So interventions must be sensitive to the social and cultural um, differences across patients and across um, countries. 
Next, please. So I want to talk to you about a second paper. This paper is an ongoing work, uh, working progress. Uh, so I'm going to show you just some very preliminary findings. Next, please. So in this paper, we investigated patient reported roles in decision making for their families, physicians, as well as for themselves. And we also investigated the association between these roles and patient characteristics, perceived quality of life and perceived quality of care. Next, please. So we asked two sets of questions to understand role in decision making. The first question get at who was involved in this, who has been involved in decision making. And the second uh, question was on the responsibilities of each person who was involved in the decision making. And based on two, these two sets of questions, we classified the um, decision making roles into five categories as listed here from no patient involvement. Uh, that was the first category. The second category patients is involved in the decision making but family or and physician leads the decision making. The third one is collaborative where patients make the decisions together with families and physicians. Uh, physicians. And the fourth one patient leads the decision making but family and physicians are involved as well. The last one is patient alone where patient has the full responsibility of making decisions and they reported that the others were not involved in the decision making process. Next please. So here you can see the um, statistics for these five different roles in decision making from most passive to most active for different countries. So the most commonly reported role in decision making was no patient involvement for uh, patients in Bangladesh, China, India, Sri Lanka and Vietnam. Uh, for patients in Myanmar and Philippines, the most commonly reported decision-making role was collaborative joint decision-making with family and or physicians. Next, please. Um, actually, let's just move to the next slide because I'm just going to summarize what we found given the uh, time limit. Uh, what we found that among Asians, among this population, being male, educated and coming from majority ethnic groups or higher caste groups were associated with experiencing active roles this in decision making so if you so these characteristics you know being male educated coming from the main, main group or higher caste these are characteristics common associated with privilege so more focus should be given empowering socially disadvantaged groups um, among cancer patients in asia also, what we found that engaging in shared decision making, basically collaborative decision making with patients, uh, for with physicians and family, was associated with higher um, social well-being and functional well-being and higher perceived quality of care. However, we had a very uh, surprising finding that any involvement in decision making was associated with lower emotional well-being. So there is some internal process uh, going on among patients that is associated with being involved in decision making, which is a surprising finding for us. And we really need to uh, dig in more and have discussions with our site PIs, uh, physicians from these countries to understand better what's, what's going on. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Samra. Um, I'll, I'll share my screen now. Can see? Okay. So um, another topic that we studied using our approach data was related to responsiveness of cancer care services and the inequality in responsiveness of these services that are provided by public hospitals within the Asian countries that were included in the approach study. So at the end of life, the goal of cancer care services is not just to improve patient health in terms of survival and quality of life, but these services also need to be responsive to patients' legitimate expectations in non-health domains. For instance, at end of life, patients experience a lot of symptoms that can lead to erosion of their dignity. So services or providers have to treat patients with respect and dignity at the end of life. Patients have to make tough choices between uh, whether or not to take certain life-extending treatments. Therefore, they need to be provided clear information and be involved in decision-making. And these are uh, 
domains of responsiveness um, that we studied. So most cancer care within Asia is provided by public health care system. And this public health care system has been founded uh, to ensure equity in health care access to everybody, irrespective of their ability to pay. But often the public health care system is criticized for poor responsiveness. But how exactly do we measure responsiveness of services? First of all, measurement is the key to improvement. If we don't measure something, we cannot improve. So measuring responsiveness of services is key to improving the quality of care uh, of services that are provided to make them more patient-centered. And measurement is also used to compare performance across organizations and for benchmarking. So such measurement has traditionally focused on measurement of satisfaction with services provided. And you may have found yourself measuring or filling up liquid uh, surveys that involve um, liquid um, responses on a liquid scale uh, on how satisfied you are with services provided. So the issue with this self-reported data is that uh, the responses of patients can be biased by the expectations from healthcare system. And this is what we refer to as reporting heterogeneity. So for instance, if we're comparing two groups of patients, for the same underlying latent level of responsiveness, group one may report moderate uh, responsiveness or may uh, report services as being moderately good. Well, uh, another or the group two might report uh, the same level of um, health system responsiveness to be good. To give more examples, if we are assessing inequalities in responsiveness by socioeconomic system, socioeconomic status of patients, we know that patients from low SES may have lower expectations regarding care, while those from high SES may have higher expectations regarding care. Therefore, patients from low SES may rate their care more highly, and uh, patients from high SES may rate their care less. And this may, uh, as a result, lead us to underestimate the magnitude of inequality between pay, uh, care provided to patients uh, uh, from low and high SES. To give another example, Semra uh, just talked about prognostic understanding and prognostic awareness and how we measured it in the approach survey. We asked patients how, whether they perceive their current treatments can cure them or not. And those who said uh, that their treatments can cure them were uh, interpreted as having inaccurate prognostic awareness or understanding. Now, there's a lot of literature within end of life that shows that patients who have inaccurate prognostic understanding and those who have high quality of life, they report their cancer care services to be more responsive compared to those with low quality of life and those with an accurate prognostic understanding. But this may be simply a result of their more optimistic outlook and, um, and so this might be a result of, uh, this might be causing reporting heterogeneity. So what's the solution? How can we tease that out? So in our approach study, we presented participants with vignettes. So these vignettes were hypothetical situations or uh, describing situations with a hypothetical patient that closely resembled their own situation. So for instance, the vignette that you see currently on the screen describes um, a situation in which a patient went to the doctor and the doctor was very busy. The patient wanted to ask the doctor more questions but felt that there was no time to ask questions. And so the doctor actually gave very brief information to patient about the illness. It's worded in a very neutral way. And we asked all participants of our approach study how they would rate the experience of how clearly healthcare providers explain things to them on a liquid scale from very bad to very good. And any variation on these responses uh, was attributed to differences in reporting behavior or reporting heterogeneity among patients. So we use these responses from these vignettes to correct 
for patient reported responsiveness. So our objective was to assess inequalities in responsiveness of cancer care services by patient socioeconomic status, age, gender, quality of life, and prognostic understanding. We use data from 1,000 plus patients uh, with stage four cancer from six major public hospitals in uh, China. We had three hospitals in India, one in Sri Lanka and Vietnam. And we assessed patient reported responsiveness in these three domains that I talked about, dignity, clarity of information and decision making. So patients first rated their own responsiveness on these three domains, then they answered uh, questions related to these vignettes that described a hypothetical patient's experience for these three domains. And then, so first we use some statistical analysis, uh, standard regression models to assess association between responsiveness domains and patients age, gender, SES, quality of life, and prognostic understanding. But then we also ran some models correcting for reporting heterogeneity using vignette responses. So I won't go into the details of the statistical analysis, but what we found was that patients from low and middle SES perceived lower dignity and involvement in decision-making compared to those from high socioeconomic status. When we did not correct for reporting heterogeneity, we did not see any gender differences in any of the three domains. But after correcting for reporting behavior, we found that females perceive dignity to be lower. Also when uncorrected as expected, we found that patients with high quality of life and incorrect prognostic understanding reported better responsiveness, but there was no difference in responsiveness by these characteristics after we corrected for a patient's reporting behavior. So, what this showed us was that even within public hospitals in Asia, there are inequalities in responsiveness of care by patients, gender, and socioeconomic status. Now, there could be several reasons for these inequalities. First could be patient-related factors. So patients from low socioeconomic status could have low health literacy that could limit how they interact with their providers. And even though they are receiving care from public hospitals, there are still high out-of-pocket costs that may lead to untreated symptoms and as a result, erosion of their dignity. There could be provider-related factors. Physicians uh, may have implicit bias based on gender and socioeconomic status. For instance, they may perceive patients from low SES as being less intelligent, responsive, or compliant, and therefore they may be giving less information to them compared to the kind of information that they may give to a more literate person. Similarly, we know that uh, in South Asia and the Asia Pacific region witnesses some of the highest rates of gender inequality. Yes, and this might be reflected in patient provider interactions as well, especially when the provider is a male and patient is a female. So a lot of organizations, including World Health Organizations, have recently talked about universal health coverage for end-of-life services. But what our study points out that to truly achieve universal health coverage, universal health coverage for end-of-life care services, we should also focus on removing inequalities in responsiveness of care, especially within public hospitals. And how can we do that? we could make some infrastructural changes, for instance, providing private spaces for consultation and examination for females. And uh, this may help to improve dignity for female patients. We can train providers on how to communicate with low SCS patients, for instance, by using less technical language. And um, also uh, such trainings can help improve the awareness of implicit bias. Last but least, we need to continuously monitor the quality of non-clinical care provided to patients within public hospital through an equity lens. Thanks. Yes. Hi, hi Chetna. Okay, let me pull up the slides. Okay. Hello, everybody. 
Okay, so today I will be moving on by sharing about the mental health as well as mental health service utilization that we're seeing among our South Asian advanced cancer patients. The data that we are using comes across six sites um, out of three countries, so India, uh, Sri Lanka, as well as Bangladesh. Yeah. So to give us a little bit of background, we know the, from the literature coming out mostly from North America, from Europe, from East Asia, that a significant proportion of our advanced cancer patients report anxiety and depression. The prevalence rates actually vary quite a bit and it depends a lot on the instruments used, the threshold scores, yeah, the recruitment setting, for instance, you know, um, whether it comes from an outpatient medical oncology clinic versus you know, inpatient hospice. Yeah. But the rule of thumb really is about one third usually. Yeah. And a seminal paper published in Palliative Medicine, it's been some time ago, you know, that, that actually reviewed and pulled studies together, you know, looking at prevalence among advanced cancer patients and hospice patients. Um, and that you and more importantly, use the same measure, right, which is the hospital and anxiety depression scale, and use the same cutoff score, indicated that prevalence rates of anxiety to be about 28% and depression 29%. But as you can see, you know, the range is also pretty wide. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's what the literature tells us. And beyond that, you know, another observation that we are seeing is that the presentation of patients are often comorbid anxiety and depression. So in this large scale study, you know, that was conducted with more than 8,000 cancer patients, you know, what was observed was that, so we first see like the, the proportions in the gray scale are those are, uh, 30% are in distress, but 40% out of those that were in distress, you know, were showing mixed anxiety depression. So that tells us that it's very common for, you know, for it to be mixed anxiety depression. Yeah, and so this is what we know of the literature, but what about, you know, Asia, right? What about data that comes out from Asia, especially South Asia, because there's very little information. So the aims of, you know, this current study was threefold. The first question we had was, you know, what is the prevalence of anxiety, depression, and mixed anxiety, depression like? You know? And the second one being, what are there any associated risk factors that we can see, right? Are there any social demographic factors um, that increase people's risk for, uh, you know, cancer patients' risk for anxiety and depression? Are there any clinical related factors? And, you know, are there any psychological related factors? And we were particularly interested in patient perceived cancer stigma. Now, and this, you know, this uh, idea is that uh, patient believing that other people have prejudice against them, you know, devalue them you know, um, because of their cancer diagnosis or condition. And so because of that, you know, there's less social acceptance. And so previous studies have shown that there's an association between stigmatization of cancer and depression, but it hasn't really been observed or, you know, looked at in a South Asian context. The third, you know, research question that we had was really just examining, you know, what mental health service utilization is like. So the rates of mental health service use, uh, perceived usefulness, as well as for those who weren't receiving it, you know, how open they are to receiving mental health services. So, you know, as mentioned earlier, you know, we had recruited across six sites, you know, in the Indian sites, we recruited from Delhi, Jaipur, as well as Hyderabad. Um, in Bangladesh, both our sites came from Dhaka, and then we had uh, Sri Lanka involved as well. Uh, we had used, well, the two main validated measures that were used were the heads, um, and this scale, you know, yields two subscales, the anxiety and depression subscale. We had used a threshold, threshold score of 10 um, that indicates probable caseness, and this is um, actually a somewhat more stringent. So in the literature, uh, a score of above 7 or above 10 are, you know, sometimes used, and uh, above 10 is the most stringent one. We also use the sense of uh, stigma subscale that came from Kissing's shame and stigma subscale, and this uh, measure allowed us to look at, you know, uh, uh, look at the scores where a higher score indicated higher perceived cancer stigma. So to share a little bit about, you know, who are people, you know, who are the participants, what do they look like? So the average mean age, uh, the average age was about 51 years. 
um, we had a pretty even split when it came to gender. Majority were married. Majority of the patients that came from India practiced Hinduism. Majority from Sri Lanka practiced Buddhism and majority of Bangladesh practiced Islam and plurality. So about 30%, you know, did not have any formal education, whereas about 40% had between one to 10 years of education. In terms of clinical characteristics, the biggest groups were, uh, the can, you know, the cancer site groups were GI and colorectal, followed by breast and lung. Um, we see that when we're looking at, you know, patients' understanding of their diagnosis, which is a little bit different from, you know, how SEMRA had presented on prognosis. So just, you know, what's page, how patient understood their cancer staging to be, we see that about one out of five were um, aware of their advanced stage. Um, a small percentage, you know, thought that they were at early stage, and actually a majority did not know of their cancer staging. Um, in terms of symptom burden, the mean score was 13 out of a score of 36, um, but we also know that 80% of our sample reported four or more symptoms. Um, um, and, and we asked about common symptoms such as pain, nausea, you know, vomiting, etc. Uh, we see that a majority of the sample had not delayed their treatment because, you know, and all these are clinical characteristics where we were interested in seeing whether they could affect, right, or they were associated with anxiety and depression. So now looking at, you know, the pool data, right, in our large data set, we're seeing that across uh, the sites, about half of patients reported, you know, not meeting threshold for anxiety and depression, and approximately half reported some type of distress. And out of that, you know, out of those who were distressed, uh, or 24% of our entire samples, about half of those here, right, had mixed anxiety, depression. And then what we're also seeing is that there are more patients with just depression only uh, compared to anxiety only. And, and I think the big takeaway here is about half, right, approximately half are showing some level of distress. Okay. When we look at the breakdown of anxiety and depression by sites, where um, the blue represents anxiety levels, proportion of anxiety and rate for depression. You know, we're seeing some patterns here where it seems like depression, proportion of depression seems to be higher than anxiety across sites. Yeah. Um, I looked a little bit, we look a little bit closely at this site, Bangladesh site one, where we have the highest um, rates of uh, depression. And, you know, this could be because we had recruited purely from a palliative care unit at this site, whereas with all the other sites, they came from either non pal care or they were mixed. So we can see that maybe that has an effect. Um, okay, in looking at factors associated with our outcomes of interest, so what we're seeing is that being female, right, as well as younger age, uh, increases the odds of people, you know, reporting or patients and, uh, reporting anxiety. What we're seeing is clinical factors wise that symptom burden should to, to seem to be important here, right? It increases the odds of, you know, psychological morbidity across the board. And then when it comes to, you know, stigma, we're seeing that, you know, higher perceived stigma also, you know, increase the odds of, you know, uh, patients reporting anxiety, depression or mixed anxiety, depression. So next, you know, what we looked at was the rates of mental health service utilization. So we first, you know, pulled out the people who, you know, the number of patients who were reporting either anxiety or depression. And so this is about half our sample, 617. So out of these patients, we look at how many people, you know, how many patients had reported receiving mental health services. And we see that 3% reported being aware of receiving mental health services. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how we had asked this was gave them a list of, you know, uh, many different kinds of mental health services, including like, have you seen a psychiatrist, psychologist, a medical social worker for, you know, support, community counselor, others. Yeah. And of course, you know, these numbers are low and maybe it, is, it reflects that patients are unaware that they are receiving, you know, uh, treatment for their mood or their anxiety. Uh, and it could be that, you know, when, when this is done, uh, perhaps, you know, managed together with the other symptoms by their primary oncology provider. Um, but, but we had to ask it this way because we wanted to then next 
look at the details of the mental health service use, right? So we were interested in, oh, uh, so this is factors associated with anxiety, depression. If we can move forward, and then one more forward. Okay, great. Okay, so for those people who, you know, then said that they had not received mental health services, what we did was ask them, would you be open to receiving mental health services? And, you know, patients had the option of responding yes, no, or they're not sure. And so the green bars represent, you know, them being amenable. And so we see 38% overall are saying, okay, so that's, you know, somewhat promising. Uh, we're seeing about 30% saying no, and then, you know, 32% saying, you know, that they're not sure. Yeah. I just want to point out that, you know, with uh, India site 2 over here, where we see uh, a 92% green bar, right, that that's our Delhi site, that may be indicating that, you know, this is an urban setting, that maybe there's some higher openness, you know, in receiving mental health services. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we so actually the, the slides were flipped. With this slide, what we wanted to show was the kinds of mental health services that people were accessing. So, you know, I highlighted over here that when it comes to the actual mental health service, about 50%, you know, uh, were actual profession, mental health professionals, whereas 50% and mostly coming from Sri Lanka were others. And in this group, actually a majority of them were um, religious leaders. So they had reported either getting, you know, uh, counseling services from priests or korukals. In terms of, you know, uh, the modality that most of the majority were counseling based, majority of them were in hospital settings, whether inpatient or outpatient. And then, um, you know, what is promising is when we, are, when we asked how useful mental health services were, a high majority, 80 over percent, had said very helpful or quite, you know, quite, quite helpful. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so, you know, in summary then, right, that what we are seeing here is that approximately half of our South Indian advanced cancer patients, you know, who were surveyed were reporting some level of distress, yeah, um, and so about a quarter of them had actually mixed anxiety, depression, uh, one out of five depression, and then a smaller proportion, just anxiety alone. And out of those who were distressed, you know, 3% were aware they could report receiving mental health services. And so, you know, what's, what we're seeing is that this ratio, right, between those who are receiving services and those who are reporting distress is pretty vast, yeah, which tells us that there's an opportunity over here for us um, in meeting, you know, this unmet need. Yeah, um, especially when, you know, we're seeing that majority who did report mental health services, you know, um, reporting that they were useful, right? Um, and that 38% were open in receiving mental health services. There are several, you know, practice and uh, policy implications. Uh, you know, it's common, like, like we do it all the time, right, that we, we assess for symptom burden as part of our clinical, you know, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, sorry, and I'm seeing a comment over here, 54% South Indian. Actually, what I meant was 54% South Asian. And I had that in my updated slides, but, you know, this was a, a bit of an older version. So, yeah, South 54% uh, South Asian. But going back to the implications, right, that we assess for um, symptom burden, you know, as part of standard care, but we may not be doing psychological distress and we may not be doing, you know, perceived stigma and how it affects patients. And maybe that's something for us to think about that, you know, that can be part of, you know, standard clinical assessment. Yeah. Um, also, of course, another implication to think about is should we be, can we, you know, screen systematically for distress? Of course, in order to do that, you know, resources have to be ready, right? The hospital, whether at the hospital level, whether at the department level, um, that the receiving, you know, uh, services Need, has to have the capacity to be able to do so. And then the last thing is, you know, the initiatives in tackling stigma, stigma associated with cancer, as well as what we're seeing, stigma associated with mental health care, right? Um, and, and to that, you know, I see two, like one at the more individual level, for instance, you know, once we have identified, uh, you know, that there is stigma to actually work through that, but then also at a larger level, which is more public health, um, to 
are there campaigns that can be run? You know, we know that there are a lot of anti-stigma campaigns that have been quite successful, for instance, surrounding mental health, surrounding uh, disability, disfigurement. And so if this is something that can also be done with cancer, you know, maybe we can see this shift that there's more openness. Yeah. Okay, and so that wraps up my presentation. I think it's back to you, Eric. Okay, thanks, Irene. So um, I'm going to just give a couple minute talk about a paper that we're currently working on and then hopefully take some questions. So uh, this paper is called The Association of Self-Blame with Treatment Preferences, and we're pooling data from, from several of our sites to answer this question. Now, it, it turns out that that when it comes to self blame, uh, there's there's two types, and I would I would actually argue there's there's sort of three types, because the two types that we focus on one is called behavioral self blame, which basically says I blame myself for for getting cancer because of things that I did, and and the other is called character characterological self blame which is basically saying, I blame myself for getting cancer because of the type of person that I am. Now, the reason I said sort of three types is because my, my general feeling is in, in many cases, they're actually right. Uh, and so you, you may have self-blame, rightly so or wrongly so. And we, we look into this in our data, but just to give you an example, like in, in uh, in Sri Lanka or, or Myanmar, uh, unfortunately, a lot of our uh, patients were, were chewers of uh, betel nut. And so they wind up with these head and neck cancers and, and many of them rightly point out that they caused it. Uh, now, as you'll see in a second, lots of people believe that they caused their cancer from things that I think are pretty wacky and, and probably not causal. So sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Now, our, our question was if you blame yourself for getting cancer, do you do things differently? So maybe you, you don't pursue as much life extending care or you don't manage your pain, you don't wanna spend as much money as you might otherwise. And so we were interested and we tried to use uh, a few questions on this instrument to, to get some, some insight into that question. Uh, you can see we used a couple of the India sites, China, Sri Lanka, and Vietnam. We ended up with almost a thousand patients in the study. Uh, if you look at the questions that, that we had, we had uh, a question that, that basically says, uh, you know, how much do you blame yourself for uh, any behavior that may have led to your cancer with a response options. And then we said for the, for the kind of person you are, uh, being an unlucky person who has things like cancer happen to them. But then we had a list of things down below, again, related to behavioral self-blame that you, you know, I think are you legitimately probably did cause your cancer. You may have if you're a smoker, chewer, heavy drinker, overweight. Uh, there's a, quite a few who thought they caused their cancer just from being bad people. Uh, I, I don't think that's causal, but who knows. Uh, but then we also explored treatment preferences. And so we said, you know, are you the sort of person who, who wants to uh, extend life as much as possible and don't care so much about costs? Or are you somebody who wants to minimize costs, even if it means uh, a shorter life, uh, to try to get a sense of where they were and whether or not the, they thought that they caused their cancer might influence this outcome. As well as, you know, a fairly simple question about uh, uh, taking pain relief. So if this was a, a, you know, a much longer, more extensive survey, we'd have whole batteries related to these things. But for approach, we had lots of questions. We touched on little domains. And so this is what we had. So I would say it's a bit more exploratory, uh, but, but certainly interesting nonetheless. And in fact, uh, one of the things that we learned is that there's a lot of blame going on. Uh, now, we, we 41% believe that they caused their cancer through their behavior. Uh, another 49%, although there might be some overlap, said that they, they believe that the type of person that they are was responsible for their cancer. And I, I do think it's worth pointing out that these are cancer patients, but they're by no means old people. We have a fairly large age range. Uh, and, and, you know, when anybody gets cancer, it's sad, but when, when young, healthy, you know, cohorts are winding up with, with advanced cancers, it's really sad. And, um, you know, quite a few of these people are in that group of young 
you know, should be healthy individuals. Now we looked at whether we thought it was logically consistent. Now I can't say for sure if being a bad person doesn't cause cancer, but our sense was that, uh, you know, most of the people who, who thought that they caused their cancer by their character probably didn't. Uh, and, and I would argue that the same goes for the behavior, but at least 19% seem to, to maybe legitimately have grounds for thinking what, that they caused their cancer. Now, in the interest of time, I won't go into the details, but at least given the way we asked the questions, uh, which wasn't uh, certainly not ideal, but, but we weren't able to tease out we, we found a lot of depression in our data, as Irene talked about, uh, you know, not inconsistent with believing that, that they, you know, essentially they put themselves into this mess. And so a lot of people certainly were, were walking around with very heavy burdens, but we didn't find much in the way of how it influenced the, the, the two health seeking behavior questions that we had. But for characterological self-blame, we actually found something that, that was the opposite, that those who, who blamed themselves based on their, their character were actually more likely to be using pain relief. And uh, when we looked at the data, this seemed to be moderated by their, their depression. So for whatever reason, those who, who were more depressed tend to, to maybe be more engaged in the health system or, or seek more uh, you know, ways to sort of blunt their, their mental health issues, maybe pain is one. Uh, so, so that's really that. Um, anyone who's interested, we're happy to share uh, the results of all these things as we have them. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to dwell on the, the sort of upshot of this paper, but just in the interest of time, I, I do want to just make a, a general statement about the approach project. I mean, as I said in the beginning, we spent a couple hundred thousand dollars at least on this thing. It's been a several years worth of work and not an, uh, you know, an insignificant investment. So it's fair as a director of the center to say, what well, was it worth it? Uh, and and I, I would say, you know, we write papers. I think that's sort of what academics do. But I think writing papers for the sake of writing papers is is not particularly useful. I think the question is, are we able to, to have an impact? And I think what we've done is created an opportunity. I think the data that's coming out of these papers should be put in front of policymakers and, and, and raise some of the issues that, that we've presented to here. We also need to continue to work with our partners to say, okay, what's next? I think we, we even within Singapore, we, we've done a fairly good job of pointing out lots of problems. And I think we've done less of a good job about uh, bringing solutions. And so, our center is really transitioning now from, from you know, the early years of running surveys and showing lots of problems to now doing interventions to say, this is how we're gonna address those problems. And we're, I think we're doing a great job of making that turn in Singapore, but we really wanna work uh, with our partners in the region and, and do that. And if we can, then I would say, absolutely, this was successful. So I would say for now, uh, verdict's not out yet. So we've got two minutes. Uh, I did see a couple of questions have come in. Uh, one of them is asking about, uh, should terminal cancer patients have a right to physician-assisted suicide, euthanasia in Singapore? Uh, this is tricky and I don't wanna weigh in on you know, what Singapore government should do. I have my own views on the topic, but one thing I will say is Semra and I are, are finishing up a, a different survey and in the survey, we asked people basically, you know, if you could die in 10 years from COVID or from some sort of, you know, heart disease or cancer or other things, or die in a shorter period of time, painlessly in your sleep, surrounded by friends and family, would you be willing to give up life to get the type of death that you wanted? And I won't spoil the answer, but the truth is the the median reduction in life expectancy to get the death that people want was very high, uh, which at least suggests to me that people have very strong preferences over, you know, trying to avoid a, what they perceive as a terrible death. Now, we didn't ask them, you know, suppose you had to get to, you know, kill yourself to get it, that, that might be different. But I think, you know, the reality is this data certainly supports the fact that there are people in Singapore and in other places who do have preferences around the timing and the way that, that they pass. And I think it's a fair question to ask whether or not governments should allow those preferences to be met. 
it's not for me to answer that question, but I do think it's a fair question to ask. Um, so I'll just jump in here because I don't think there's any other questions that I can see. I did have one, Eric, and uh, maybe it, it leads exactly to your the end of what you, you ended with, um, was the uh, application. So you, you presented your team, you and your team presented such a rich set of kind of data that you've gathered. And the entire time I was thinking, you know, what are the opportunities to apply it, to translate it into actual, you know, um, policies and change in practices across the region. So maybe not getting into it now again because of the uh, lack of time, but this is uh, something that we at the Institute are very eager to kind of see how we can facilitate. I mean, again, we can't do these things, you know, but we can hopefully facilitate some of these conversations. Um, and I was wondering, we do have connections with some patient advocacy groups across the region. And I don't know if you're already working with your own kind of patient advocacy groups, or this is something that we can offline continue to talk about uh, and see if there is some opportunity to, you know, just have more conversations around it. Yeah, I mean, certainly happy to talk offline. I think we really rely on our local partners to tell us, okay, now that we've got something that we think is useful, how do we get the ear of the right people? The truth is we're not, as researchers, we're not very good at that. And, and I think our local collaborators within countries are much better at it. Uh, and they're well connected in their own palliative care networks and their own policy networks. And so I think you know, it's something that we need to work harder to figure out how do we sort of stop just publishing paper after paper and actually take a breather and say, how do we take what we're publishing and have it actually be worth something? Okay. Well, so since we have already passed 3 p.m. on that note, I say let's continue this conversation. But thank you all very much, Eric, Semra, Chetna, Irene. Great presentation. Great to have you with us today. And, um, you know, we'll keep talking and we'll, you know, bring those whatever we can back to the wider audience. So thank you, the, everyone in the audience, for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you next month, on the last Friday of the month. So. Thanks, Amina. Bye, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.